Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Welcome to this third episode of the free weekly live webinar series brought to you by the Football Business Academy. My name is Christian Dobrev. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer of the FBA, and I will be moderating this webinar. To start, thank you for the thousand people who tuned in last week and watched David Goldblatt's seminar on how football has survived previous crises. As always, it's still available on our YouTube channel for anyone that might have missed it. For those of you who are new and hadn't heard of the FBA before, we are a Swiss-based educational institution entirely dedicated to the football industry. We run a professional master in football business, and we've also run some certificates around the world. Each week of this webinar series, we bring together different football industry experts who will share perspectives on how COVID-19 is affecting the football industry. To make it more engaging, we've decided to switch to a multi-speaker panel format, meaning that today we have four amazing professionals with us. Starting with Dr. Erkut Sogut, who we have a very respected football agent, who is a founding partner of agency Family and Football, as well as of the company Football Agent Education. Then we also have Daniel G, who is a partner and sports lawyer at London-based firm Sheridan's, and he's the author of a very popular book called Done Deal. Then moving on, we have one of the few female CEOs uh, of a football club, in this case, Patricia Rodriguez, who is in charge of La Liga side Elche, who are, who are also partners of the FBA. And last but not least, we have Philip Senderos, who recently retired as a professional football player after having played at clubs such as Arsenal, AC Milan, Fulham, as well as the Swiss national team. The session today will look at one of the most debated topics in the football industry right now, namely, what are the impacts of COVID-19 on player contracts, as well as for the upcoming transfer windows. We expect your curiosity to be as high as always, so do make sure to watch our YouTube account so that you can ask your questions to the speakers and, uh, and learn more from them. Welcome to everybody. Hi. Are you everybody doing well? Hi. Daniel, are you with us as well? Always. There you are. Great. Okay. So thank you everybody for, for joining in. Um, as I just said, it's the first time we're doing this with, with the multiple <coughs> panel format. Uh, so I hope uh, you will enjoy it. And of course, our viewers as well. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to talk about this discussion. A lot of it is written in the newspapers, in the media, um, and of course, you know, who better to ask these questions to people that are in it day in, day night, um, and dealing with the players, with the clubs, with the agents, with the lawyers, right? So to start, maybe um, Patricia, why not? You're the CEO of a, of a football club in Spain, Elche. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what decision you have taken from the moment this COVID-19 pandemic started becoming a real thing in Spain? Hello, good afternoon. Um, we are having to face um, precedent challenge in, the, in these uncertain times. The first decision that I took was uh, three weeks ago, the day in which one of our players came to the club with uh, high fever. And the doctor told me that uh, he had to, the suspicion that the player had COVID-19. So at that moment, I listened to the doctor advice. Um, finally, I decided to close the club. And a few hours later, the, the weekend, the government decided to, to declare the alarm status. Additionally, during the last week before the crisis situation started, we considered imperative that the crisis be tackled head on and be turned into an opportunity for a sustainable future. Uh, for that, we launched several campaigns in social media trying to be closer of our fan base, despite not having our main product that is uh, live football matches. And finally, the key, uh, the need of balance and economic decision with the best decision at the sports level. Um, I think that this issue, I will explain it uh, later more closely. Of course, definitely. Thank, thank you, Patricia. And then maybe, maybe I turn the next question to you, Daniel, since you deal with a lot of um, players' contracts, of course. <laughs> Have you, in your lifetime as a, as, a, as a sports lawyer, seen any clauses that include a 
a pandemic as a COVID-19 in, in, the, in, the, in the contract? Like, is there a stipulated clause for a force majeure event, for example, such as the one we are currently facing? Yeah, I think it's a really good, uh, a really good and interesting question, Christian. I think the, 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 the basic position is um, for the contracts that I generally tend to advise on in relation to employment contracts, at least, um, the standard template Premier League and uh, EFL contract does not contain a, a force majeure um, clause. And that effectively means um, that if there is no force majeure clause, um, there are other types of, at least in the UK and England and Wales, particular legal doctrines. But I don't think everyone wants to hear all about these uh, legal doctrines. I think the, the, the interesting and important elements to consider actually are what national governments are doing. Um, from a, a national employment perspective, um, what FIFA is doing from a supranational perspective and the guidance that they are ultimately providing and what we have at least seen in the Premier League, and I know that Dr. Urquhart will talk about this as well in his experiences across Europe, um, is the PFA, which is the Professional Footballers Association, which is the representative, representative governing body for footballers, they, as one of the stakeholders, are liaising with the variety of other stakeholders, including the Premier League, um, uh, national associations and clubs, to try and see, firstly, if there is a way to be able to either defer salaries, to be able to reduce salaries for this period. But ultimately, under English and Wales law, employment law, it is not possible to make unilateral decisions. They have to be done if there is a, a variation to an employment contract with the consent of the employees and it is the same way with the consent of the players and as you would have probably seen i know everyone has their issues as well at the moment across lots of different jurisdictions but there has been a, a strange narrative developing in the uk whereby politicians seem to be um confusing topics and um, effectively requesting football players as opposed to any other people in the entire sector and industry to be taking pay cuts and suddenly the, the spotlight seems to be shone on football players. So, you know, obviously I'd welcome Dr. Urquhart's thoughts on this, but it's, um, it's a strange time on a number of, uh, a number of levels. Yeah. So Dr. Urquhart, um, you obviously deal with a, a wide variety of football players um, from the young ones who maybe have just signed their first professional contract all the way up to the Mesut Ozil's of the world who obviously have uh, a very long career um, behind them already. What, what have been the, the reactions uh, in, in your player portfolio, if I can call it that? I mean, uh, first of all, thanks again for having us and sharing uh, this thing with all you guys together here. Um, and it's a pleasure. And uh, for myself and for my players, it's something new. First of all, this is something no one has dealt before. I mean, for everyone, it's a situation we are dealing for the first time. And... Uh, there is a difference, of, obviously, between younger players and players who are already established and are there for the last 10 years and earning significant money. And this is like, but the players generally, uh, because we represent players in Austria, in Germany, in Turkey or in England. And when I talk to them, so most of the players are really doing something at home right now. But this is the, the time when they're really, some of them has like from the clubs, most of them actually a plan what they should do every day. So there's a, like a structure for them when they wake up. So they do some sports. They, they, some of them have a gym at home. So they can also go into gym. Some of them are the garden. They can do some running. So every one of them, we, we are trying to focus on mostly of the weaknesses and trying to use this time. Okay, what are you missing? Like what was something? What was your weaknesses? What, what can we work on it? And mentally, I think it's very important to be like in touch with them. So, and talk to them and keep them like uplifted and positive and tell them like, this will be over. Because you have to imagine for a football player, I mean, uh, the life changes rapidly. Like if you can't get out anymore and tra you train every day, you have your teammates and suddenly you're at home and you become really a father, maybe if you have a boy or, you know, so you realize, well, wait a minute. Like, so it's not easy, honestly, for everyone. It's not just for the players, also for the clubs. For everyone is a new situation and we have to all i think that's what uh, dan said like we have to i mean deal this situation together and i think it becomes in uk like the the feeling that players on one side clubs on the other side there is a fight which is put in by certain people from the politicians 
And so it, it's kind of, it's coming to an, a very uncomfortable situation where players are put in one corner and said, you know, you should do also your duty here. You know, you're greedy you're football players. Like, I mean, that's easy to pinpoint some people out and say, what are you doing? There? You know, I mean, that's, this is not something the players want. I mean, I've seen so many players, they do so many charity stuff. They help to uh, not just with football, also they do so much, not just in the UK, for example, some players, their families abroad, they're helping there as well. I mean, players generally do a lot. And I think that's important to know as well. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And uh, so then, Philippe, you uh, recently retired uh, from being a professional football player. So luckily, if we can use a word, you don't have to deal with any of this. But if you were still a player, how do you think you would have reacted to, to the situation? Good afternoon. Thanks for, for having me, first of all. Um, no, I think, um, of course, I've retired, but like everyone else, uh, we have to deal with this situation. And uh, first and foremost, I think um, we have to deal with it as human beings. Uh, we're not football players or doctors or um, any other uh, work. We, we're all uh, human beings and uh, we're all confined to our uh, personal spaces. Uh, our homes and, and we have to deal with the same problems at, uh, at this moment. So whether whether you usually uh, play at the weekend or not um, doesn't really matter at this time. Um, so we have this responsibility um, in, in our society to behave the right way and, and to, to do good for, for the others. Uh, a lot of people do already that and um, and now uh, we're confined to our home. So we have different responsibilities that we have to do. Like uh, Dr. Erkut said uh, earlier, um, uh, to be a father is, uh, is something I've been on the, on the go for many years now and, and traveling and playing uh, um, all over the world. And, and now I'm, I'm, I'm at home with my son and, and my uh, baby. And you know, I've never spent that much time with, uh, with my family. So in a way, I'm, I'm very thankful to that. Uh, to, to be able to do that. But of course, uh, this is my responsibility uh, to look after my family and make sure uh, everyone is fine. Um, it's not an easy situation for sure for, uh, for players who are currently on the contract who have uh, different um, um, contract situations. And, uh, and of course, it, there's a lot of things going through uh, their mind, I'm sure. Thank, thank you, Philip. Um, going back to Patricia then, can you, can you run us through the process that you you did with with the different players or I guess their their agents in, in your case like was it very different from one player to the other or, or was there like more of a collective decision -making? absolutely I agree with Arkut because uh, the, the now we have the situation like fighting between uh, clubs against the players so I agree with that um, for me it's perfectly clear that footballers are no different to, to the rest of society. But uh, regarding what is happening, it seems that some players find it difficult to understand that the current situation in which we are living affects the entire population and they are included. In my opinion, the role of uh, that the Spanish Footballers Association here in Spain is playing is uh, complicating a little bit the negotiations. Just yesterday, they released uh, they issued a, a press release referring to La Liga's economic control measures. And um, I think that they are mixing different concepts and they denote a short-term vision. Uh, the clubs, we need to maintain the profitability of our companies. And the main part of the p &L of a club depends on player salaries. So if we don't have the same revenues as planned at the beginning of the season, we will need to adapt to our cost structure. There are also players who are aware of the situation and uh, who firmly believe that uh, we have the responsibility to, to reach an agreement. And I think that at this point and in this vision, the educational level really influences the, the way of thinking. Uh, now we have tried to explain them that the salary reduction measure to re reach with the players in the event that the season continue, it would be like a retention, a deferred income. Uh, however, sometimes they are forcing the situation so much that in many cases there are uh, clubs in, in Spain that they are going to, to have to opt to apply the uh, temporary employment restructuring plan, uh, which is a, different, a definitive measure. But um, I'm sure that um, even the negotiations with them have been and continue to be difficult. I'm confident that we can resolve the issue in the short term and uh, decide which percentage of the damage is assumed by the club and which percentage by, by the players. 
Thank you, Patricia. Um, spe speaking of clubs, Daniel, um, I wanted to ask you, obviously in, in England, the, the situation seems to be very different than one in Spain or, or Italy, where there seems to be more of a collective uh, approach to it. Um, what are the, some of the best cases in, in England that you've seen in terms of clubs really taking you know, the kind of leadership that uh, I guess the fans want to see in these challenging times? And, and taking actions even before the likes of the FA, the PFA, and the, the EFL and the Premier League um, agree on. So, yeah, I, I've been talking about this quite a lot over the last few weeks with quite a lot of my clients and, and people in the industry and, and journalists more generally. And I think where I think um, that there has been potential issue and conflict, especially when the, the PFA in the, in the UK um, has um, occurred is is generally because that I don't believe there can be a one size fits all approach for everybody. And that is maybe part of the issue is that we've seen particular instances where <clears throat> some clubs in the championship, i.e. the league below the Premier League, have come to agreements with deferring um, wages. Others have actually managed to have agreements to reduce wages for a particular period of time. And, and some of the issues around that and some of the, the reports and conversations that I, I've had is, in effect, if you have one body representing all players, um, there are going to be lots of different fits according to particular circumstances of the club. Now, I completely agree with what Patricia says, which is I think it is sensible to have um, a, a grown-up conversation between the players at the particular club because each club's situation will be very different. And I think what players are very concerned about, one, is whether um, if there are profitable clubs that they are employed, or employed for, that actually this is just um, something which might just not necessarily um, help the non-playing staff, but will just reduce the, the club's cost base and make it more straightforward for them to um, keep on operating whilst also there are obviously a number of clubs that are in significant financial hardship um, and those individuals and those executives can have grown up conversations again with the players, their representatives, um, etc. Now, what also complicates matters is there are, depending on which country um, the, the clubs and players are, um, are part of and the, the tax and um, the salary and um, the particular employment schemes in place, Dr. Urquhart and I were talking about this recently, was um, there are um, particular protections in place. So in the UK, there is a scheme called furloughing, which effectively provides a safety net for anyone that would otherwise effectively be sacked because of, or there wouldn't be a job uh, in place of um, um, letting that individual go, because otherwise you have a complete, um, uh, a complete, well, a very, very difficult situation to handle where a, a significant part of the workforce might be laid off. So this is the safety that is provided. Now, the, the query is whether very big and large football clubs should be taking advantage of those government um, um, short for, or rather government safety nets and subsidies um, in order to put some of their staff, just like in other industries as well, um, into that protection situation. So it's not necessarily just a, a player and club matter. It's not necessarily just a national governmental issue. It's not necessarily just a national uh, labour law and FIFA and jurisdiction issue. Um, it is all of those different combinations all interplaying at a time when the truth is there are a lot more significant issues going on than football. But we understand that this is one of a, is a significant industry and hopefully when things start getting back to normal, um, the authorities just in sports and just across other industries need to have a plan so that the economy, which, you know, it goes without saying, has dropped exponentially like since records began since the Second World War, needs to start recovering at some point. Christian, I think you're right. Yeah. Th thanks, sir. Um, so picking up on that, maybe for Urquhart, um, obviously as an agent, you have a particular role to play because you stand between the club and the player. 
what, what's that dynamic like right now? Like, obviously, you know, in, in football, um, a lot of trust is, is placed uh, towards the agents from the player side. At the same time, the club obviously have to protect their own interests as well. How is that dynamic exactly right now in, in, in light of the COVID-19? I mean, um, I've seen different cases in different countries so far. So um, I can tell, especially for my players in Germany, it's club by club. And I've seen it's, it's done very well so far. And uh, um, it's usually a deferral in the beginning because clubs react right away to a certain situation, which they say, look, we have to defer, let's say 30%. I have a club where I have 30%. I have a club where I have 15%. Again, it differs of the club's financial and economic situation. So they're asking the players, we would like to pay that money towards end of the year or next year. And then they send an agreement and we look after this agreement with the players and we say, and, and, we, and we agree, we say that makes sense. The clubs right now has some cash flow problems. Let's pay, let's uh, get that payment later on. It's good for the club, it's good for the player. So it's understandable. So we're seeing it, we talk with the players, we have to explain them what it means. So uh, that's our role. And then we go forward. So this happened in, in one case in Germany. So the club is doing the same thing, a deferral, but there's not even a written contract so far. They just told the players it will be a deferral, which is like a little bit, where are we here? And uh, what can happen in future? I think everything should be done written. Everything, everything should be done mutually agreed. And these are, for example, some cases in Germany. I have also a case in Germany where a club is asking 10% for cut, right? And 10% is... So for a, again, for a younger player, it might be a lot. For a bigger player, it might be not a lot. But again, there we could find also an understanding and we could move forward. In Austria, for example, there's a general cut 20% like the players and the government drop comes in and helps with payments. So, I mean, there's different situations. In England so far, I haven't dealt with any club on that, right? Like on a, with the bigger Premier League players. As you know, there are talks going are ongoing between the Professional Footballers Association and the Premier League had some talks and meetings. We are left out so far. We are not inside this uh, kind of uh, uh, situation where we are apart or we're not playing so far apart. The players not either and we are not too. So in the end, obviously, whatever happens, it has to will go through to us. They, the players will not sign anything what the clubs will put on the in front of them and say, sign it. They will not, never sign that and not ever player should sign just an agreement without really reading it and understanding it, checking in with their lawyers or with the representatives who, or with their parents. If they are 16, 17, it's maybe enough that the father have a look, but they shouldn't sign anything before not really checking it. And, and for both sides, I think the most important thing is here. It needs to be fair. It needs to be transparent and honest that both parties, the clubs and the players coming together because I mean they work with each other in the same environment why can't they sit with each other and talk why can't they explain the situation to the players or to the representatives because the situation right now here I can talk about England is not helpful and then when politicians come into the game as well and telling the players should do their part I mean what are you politicians doing for example could be the answer uh, you can't even test the NHS people so far I mean, your role is, you know, protect the people in the NHS and not, or should we start talking about their richer people in this country than five, 600 Premier League players, right? I mean, it's a destruction. They're smart, they're politicians. We know what they're doing. We're not stupid, right? And the players are not stupid either that something is happening here. Someone is distracting the course actually from the main topic into footballers' life because it's always easy to talk about footballers and their lives. And, you know, they're famous. They have a lot of money. I mean... I just listened to another um, uh, video and there was uh, someone was saying 50% of the footballers are not earning more than 1,000 euro per month all over the world, right? I mean, there are so many issues for these kind of players. No one is talking about them. It's all about these 500, 600 Premier League players. I mean, it's easy to target them. I'm saying again, they need to sit down and talk and start the procedure. And I think the PFA, if they have so much money, they should contribute with putting that money into the pot so they can give it to the players in the lower leagues. That would be a good start from them. Great. Thanks, Erkut. Philip, going back to you, um, obviously we have seen, again, um, players taking action on their own sometimes uh, while they're waiting to see what their club is going to do. Uh, some players um, have made donations. Others have set up uh, funds, uh, charity funds. Um, others 
openly say that they would take a cut, others maybe not so much. What's your opinion on all of this? Obviously, football players, they're, they're team players, right? So isn't there um, an opportunity for the players to unite and do something together that will make a stronger impact into the football industry and society as a whole, being the role models that they are? Of course, they're role models. Of course, a million people tune in every week uh, to watch them play. But uh, um, like uh, Dr. Eric had said and, and, and the others on the panel, it, we're not the only ones. I mean, football players are not the only ones. If, if football players have to do something and because it's very um, uh, open to everyone to see, uh, there's many other people uh, who, who should um, take action before uh, football players, I think so. Um, yes, football players are, are so public that they, they, can, make an in, uh, they can make a, a, a very big impact. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the conversation needs to be, uh, needs to be clear and, and for everyone to see. Um, but I don't think uh, football players should be the, 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 at the front of, of everything. I think uh, many other people have to take decisions before. Um, for for players to to come to this agreement, um, like like you said, football players already do a lot of things. Many of them have uh, have their own uh, charities uh, towards the um, this virus um, problem, and and I'm sure uh, a lot of them uh, contribute uh, within their community and their home. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've I've answered your question. Uh, first, uh, a lot of people need to to take action, and then uh, it will come to the to the players like like everyone in the community. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, one of the questions of one of our viewers, uh, which is directed at Patricia. So we have Sofia Arango asking, what economic setbacks is the club facing at the moment? And what can you learn from this to be better prepared if something like this happens again in the future? Uh, the, the most important um, economic, um, the most important problem that we are fearing is that uh, we need to balance our cost with our uh, revenues. Um, so some people who work in, in football industry tend to always think that soccer is different. And uh, I think that is precisely the error and what has led us in previous years to bad practices and to many clubs entering bankruptcy. Uh, we need to, to be prepared for the future, which means uh, reducing the blow that the coronavirus will have on the sport and in, it's in, in, in the industry. And I think that there is no doubt that we want to complete the current campaign and we are working for that with UEFA, FIFA and with the Spanish Football Federation also. But um, now uh, we have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Uh, which is that the remainder of the season cannot be completed. Uh, if that is the case and no more match are played, uh, La Liga now estimates that we will lose 900 million euros. In our case, in Elche, we will lose around 30% of our revenues. Uh, so I think that uh, we need to, to uh, be very, to be careful with that situation because football clubs, we are profit-based company and the professionals that we are managing them, uh, we have the obligation to apply the required measures to warranty the, the sustainability of the clubs in the long term. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Daniel, what's your legal opinion on how the situation might or will create, create legal precedent in, uh, in the future, uh, maybe as soon as this next uh, transfer window, will we see, and this is a question from Ryan, do you think future player contract will have clauses which cover situations like COVID-19? Do you think this summer automatically all contracts will suddenly have these types of clauses? I, I think the short answer is, is that nothing like this has ever happened this for the last 100 years. So it's sometimes very difficult to um, expect the totally unexpected. I think that's the first thing to always say. And back to your first question, Christian, it was sometimes you can have force majeure contracts which supposedly do cater for the unexpected when things can't actually happen. But I think the, the precedent that I think it should hopefully set, it's not really a legal precedent, but I think in some ways it's a practical matter, which is if we imagine that the football industry really apart from the national employment laws, is built around 
different regulations. It's built around national association regulations, UEFA or um, uh, particular country or intra-country regulations, as well as then um, FIFA global regulations. And as a result of that, a lot of the different um, parameters that are so traditionally accepted within the game, I believe need to be flexible. We need to have a pragmatic approach to deciding how things are run um, and how things may work in the next six months to one year. Because I, I completely agree with Patricia. I think if the position has to be that because the economic losses are so significant from a broadcasting perspective, for example, and the communication from FIFA, UEFA, the national associations is that at the moment, the season is going to be continued indefinitely, in part from a, um, a financial perspective, but in part because of a, um, a competition element to ensure that the competition can be finalized. Then if we look forward, my view is, is that, again, that, that flexibility and pragmatism has to be managed in terms of when the season can be finished, when the transfer windows open, what happens to particular contracts, be it player contracts or sponsorship deals. It might be for the, for the, for the next two or three seasons, the season does not run like the seasons have run for the last 100 years because we are in such exceptional times. So I think what is required is I, I hear quite a lot of the time, even from my friends and otherwise, which is, uh, we should just avoid the season and make sure the next season can start on time. My view is, apart from the very biased fact that I'm a Liverpool fan, um, uh, and also because um, in other ways, I, I believe in a way that there should be some type of fairness, i.e. your performances and the team's performances across different divisions should count. And because if we talk about precedent, the types of legal issues that will no doubt arise if a season is voided, that I think clubs need to be very careful about the possibility of ending seasons early. It may work in some financial and beneficial interests for them. But ultimately, what I think the football family needs to be doing um, is putting in place a process and a procedure and a framework, which can obviously be varied because they are the very creators of that framework to ensure that in the short and medium term, um, the, 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 the significant consequences of what is outside of everyone's control can be managed as effectively as possible. Because otherwise, if, if we live within the own, our own boundaries of what we are used to, then nothing will change. Ultimately, this flexibility is absolutely crucial. Thanks. Erkut, for you, a question from yours, Brandley. How do you anticipate dealing with contracts that are supposed to end before the end of the season? Sorry, can you say again? I just, I just couldn't hear the first. So on, under the assumption that you know, some of the leagues in which you have players, um, that they might go longer than the 30th of June, how do you anticipate dealing with contracts that are supposed to end at the end of June? Are, you gonna, are the players going to keep playing with their current club um, until the season is finished anyway? Will that be with the same salary as before? What if they had any you know, future transfer potentially pending already? How, how are you dealing with that? I mean, uh, again, that's very difficult to say because we don't really know. I mean, Patricia has said as well, we hope that, and she believes it, that the season will go on and we play and the players will play and we will finish the season. And uh, obviously the most of the contracts goes until end, uh, end of June. So that means uh, for the part in July, there must be something in agreement between the parties there where the players and the clubs will sit together and say, this contract will be extended for one more month under certain conditions, if there will be whatever that could be, right? And, uh, but I think it's need to be something written as well from insurances side and everything else, legal side. I mean, Dan is more an expert here than me because if something happened, I would probably need a lawyer like Dan next to me. So we would go to it together and fight through it. I mean, no, I mean, honestly, it will really, we don't know it yet, how it will uh, look like. I mean, the clubs will be prepared, obviously, for that situation. And they will probably face the players and say, look, the season will end one month later. And we need to agree that the contract will be extended under the cer same circumstances or whatever, just an extension without payment with them. I don't know how that will be look like, because it's, again, it's something new for everyone. 
again, we can just win all together with sitting together, talking, looking into each other's eyes and be fair and transparent and to find a solution. And this, this is something what will happen. I think like very important for the players this year, Christian, to know like what will happen like, because the players really want to be sitting there and will understand. And this is what we're lacking right now because it's just in the media, but it's not with the players or with the representatives. So no one talks with each other directly. I think it's the time that clubs and players, they talk with each other directly and solve this problem, especially now in England, like, like done in other countries. I mean, what can be done? I always say, so the, the, the one thing in my personal opinion, a deferral is a start, right? For a club, if there's uncertainty, what will happen? Because if I don't first know if I still want to play the league or not, if I can get the TV money or not, then the deferral is kind of a protection for everyone to say, let's defer these payments a certain amount. Let's say one club might need 50% deferral, one might need 30, 120, 110, one might not need anything to defer, to say, let's defer that payment towards end of this year or next year. And this is something which players and club can understand and agree together very quickly, I think. So the clubs can face it and know they have cash, no cash problems. They can go on for the next two, three months. After that, I think the step two where clubs and the uh, players will come again to again and they can talk about the cuts if necessary. Because I think right now agreeing on a cut is in my opinion, I wouldn't recommend for my player to say you should agree today on a cut because I don't know tomorrow if the league will be played and the, and the clubs will get the tier, can hold on on the TV money, on the sponsorship money and so on. And if there will be games, will fans attend, will fans not attend? What are exactly the financial impacts? What, are, what is exactly the financial loss we, the clubs will have? We can just see three to six months later. We can't see it today because today is deferral is for me an option. But to say today, agree on a cut and then uh, and for the players later on, go and run behind the money because the clubs make in the end the same profit they did last year. I mean... I mean, it's again, it's need to be transparent, fair, and both sides sitting together. And the clubs has to explain after a certain amount of time, after a deferral, they can explain, look, guys, we did that amount of money, we did that amount of loss. And how much loss did you guys did as a club? How much are the owners losing here? And how much are fans losing here? No one is talking about fans. And I'm thinking the fans already paid their season ticket, right? Are they getting something back for the games which they can't attend anymore? Who thinking about fans, for example, right? No one. So I'm just thinking like thinking out loud. I'm thinking we have to solve a problem right now, which is urgent. This could be deferral. And later on, you can talk about other financial impacts for club and players. Thank you, Rupert. Yes, Daniel, you wanted to add a comment to that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't want to monopolize the conversation at all, but just very briefly, some of the things that that I know that FIFA are talking about as well, that I'm sure Patricia and, um, and Philippe can talk about as well, which was, you know, the, under English and Wales law, it's not possible to unilaterally extend um, the contract. If the player doesn't want to extend past the 30th of June, I, I cannot see a situation where FIFA are going to just dictate that that must be the case. The flip side though, and the practical flip side, is that if the transfer window hasn't opened, for a free transfer agent and that player hasn't signed a pre-contract. I can't imagine there are going to be too many clubs that are going to be willing to take that player on and potentially incubate a couple of months worth of wages before they can register the player for the new league, for the new league season possibly, and not knowing when that would happen. So I wonder whether that is the incentive that the player has, at least for the short term, to continue playing that season. But it's the same with loan players returning. It's the same for transfer installments. It's this, all, all those types of timing issues are, are very important. Thank you, Daniel. Philip, from your, from your perspective, um, obviously there's different scenarios. It all depends on, on what the government uh, decides on what the health um, specialists advise. Um, but in the, in the scenario of finishing a season under closed doors, what do you think that impact will have on, on the players, if they have to play, you know, 10 more games behind closed door, do you think that will have a, an effect on their performance on the pitch? Well, not only on the performance, but who, who guarantees the, the health of the players and their family and, the, and everyone around them? You know, I think it's a bigger question than just playing a, a football game behind closed doors. Um, so they would have to test every single player, every single staff member, make sure they're, they're healthy. 
and they don't get in contact. And you're talking about a lot of players. So if one of them uh, in the whole league gets uh, uh, infected by the virus, then the whole league goes to uh, goes down again. So I, I don't see I, I don't see this happening really because there's too many uh, factors um, and too many people that would uh, that would that would be affected. You know. So. Um, I don't know. Uh, obviously, the lawyers and the agents and CEOs are, are, are more um, prepared um, than, than me to, to answer this question. I think uh, as a player, is a lot of uncertainty at the time, at this time, and they just need to keep working on their body and their mental and make sure they're, uh, make sure they're ready whenever uh, the decisions are made at the top. Uh, there's not much more that, uh, that I can add on this, unfortunately. Thank you. Speaking of uh, of the top, Patricia, um, obviously La Liga seems to be doing a very good job at uh, you know gathering all the clubs together and and and, sh- and be transparent as as Erkut said and, and share as much information and, and ideas as possible. Um, and from what I understand, as you said, there's different scenarios in terms of best case to worst case scenarios. Now, obviously, part of that uh, they identify the poten- the potential losses that La Liga uh, clubs would make under the different scenarios, uh, going from uh, 150-ish million if uh, the games will be played with the public, all the way up to a billion potential loss um, if they have to suspend the, the season. What, um, what measures do you think um, La Liga is, is taking differently from, from some of the other leagues which they can take uh, lessons from? If, if- Assuming that you've also spoken to some colleagues in, in other countries uh, across Europe, we even have uh, some viewers uh, also asking the question, saying that in Poland they're doing something similar. What, what, what would you, what would you um, be able to share about that? Uh, for me, one of the most positive things that I have noted during this crisis is that for once, the clubs of La Liga were working together, focused on the same objective. We are working in a coordinated way, sharing information, just as the players have been doing so far. And I think that gives us uh, much more strength. Uh, during last three weeks, uh, the 80% of my time I spent in calling people, talking with La Liga, chatting with colleagues from other clubs, and meetings with our captains by video conference. So um, additionally, furthermore, La Liga is continues supporting us in the face of the situation that we are facing due to the to the COVID-19 pandemic. So they are advising us and helping us also. They give us the necessary support to each of the clubs before the particular circumstances of, of each club. So uh, we are in a meeting each week with them. Um, they are giving us uh, their point of view, their advice, and the tools for being coordinated uh, between all the clubs of La Liga. And additionally, the, the club of uh, the clubs of, that we are playing in, in second division in La Liga Smart Bank, uh, we are coordinating in a chat, in a common chat, uh, WhatsApp, uh, in a common WhatsApp group, uh, in which we are sharing the point of view of each club, uh, the agreement that the club have reached with their captains, uh, the proposal, the um, different ways to to uh, try to reach an agreement with with the captains. So I think that the key uh, to to be in that situation that you have mentioned before, Christian, is that we are uh, sharing, coordinating, and uh, working as a as a team. Thank you. And actually, another question from from one of our uh, FBA candidates, Fahad Al Qadi. Is asking, and this is uh, definitely um, of relevance to, to Spanish clubs, knowing that uh, there's clubs that are privately owned and owned by their members. And he asks, do you see any difference in the way a club should react in this situation according to whether they're privately owned or owned by members? Uh, this is a um, La Liga has uh, started the kickoff of, of the meetings, has started by La Liga, has been started by La Liga. But after that, uh, some of the leaders of the clubs will have decided to uh, create a WhatsApp group to coordinate all of the strategy uh, that we are performing in, in, in our club. Um, and I think that it could be the, the key of the situation that we are living in now, because we know that uh, we have all the information 
and we know the measures that have been applied in other clubs of La Liga Smart Bank. Uh, so in the moment that we are negotiating or talking with our captains, our teams, uh, we can explain them the situation in different clubs and they have also that information. But uh, until this moment in, in some problems before that we have uh, uh, before, we didn't have the information about the situation in other clubs because, because the collaboration between the clubs is not uh, so easy. So for me, uh, it has been um, the key and, and I think that uh, we will uh, achieve um, an agreement with our captains due to this uh, collaborative uh, situation between the clubs. Thank you. Um, Erko, back to you. Um, obviously, as, as you mentioned it yourself as well, and, and as everybody knows, a lot can, can change in the next few months. It all depends on, on how um, we, we, we manage to stop this, this virus spreading, basically, uh, and obviously what measures are taken by each government. But putting yourself into August 2020, okay? Let's assume that the leagues have finished by then and, uh, and that the transfer season is, is going. Um, there's several uh, of our viewers asking you the question, do you already expect, because of the probable losses that clubs will face, do you already expect a, a significant decrease in transfer fees and by extension also player salaries? Do you, do you think we, we're going to see, see a big reduction in what football clubs and, and football players were used to until now? I mean, um, again, it will depend on the situation of the clubs by that time. I mean, if the games will be played and the clubs can see, okay, they made some loss, but not that much loss, I think the game will go on as it is now. So, but if the clubs coming into a situation, they lost a lot of money and obviously they will plan the next season in a different way they played before. So there will be, that means they will not spend much money anymore on transfers. They will rather look into situations where they might do loans more than buy more. I think it will more a season where a lot of loan of players will happening because of the uncertainty for the clubs. They will be less risky, I think, uh, especially now what happened. They will plan more carefully, I think. But maybe it will help also for certain clubs to be more careful in future anyways with their finances, where a lot of clubs are in debt because the way they mismanage their clubs, not just in England, it's all over the world. And uh, I've just read today, again, there's one club in championship in England has 40, 50 million loss because of uh, wrong transfers and high salaries for players. So again, uh, this will maybe change some clubs in a right way. And they will start thinking more like, like in an economic way to, you know, and, and for some owners, they might don't care, right? Simple than that. If they lose 50 million or 30 million, it's more prestige. For some owners of football clubs, they want to want to win a trophy. They don't care about if they lost 50 million or 200 million. They want to have in the end the trophy because that club is for them as a gaming center, like playing PlayStation. So we have also that kind of, we have to know that. For some people, it's different. We have members owned clubs where obviously the members are carrying the club. There's a different situation than for some owners who really want to win something. Of, it doesn't matter how. So, I mean, still there will be owners outside this will not shake them, yeah? They have resources, they have brands, sponsors to back them. They will come to the game and they want to win the game. And, and as long clubs, I always say, want a player, they will always find a way to get a player, right? And how much that it costs. So, I mean, it really depends, again, from club to club, from the people who are managing the club. It's so important that who is behind the management in that club, what kind of ownership is there, what are their goals? And from that point, in some clubs, nothing might change. In another clubs, a lot will change. So for us, it's just to see how things develop. It really depends on the financial situation of the clubs in the next few months. Thank you. Daniel, you, you mentioned FIFA um, a number of occasions before. What's, what's your anticipation of the, the transfer window mechanism, right? Um, obviously across Europe, a lot of countries have a very similar window. But in light of COVID-19, maybe it may, may well be that certain countries have to wait a lot longer until they can actually uh, finish their season and as such start doing transfers. What do you suggest or what would you do if you were at FIFA deciding right now on, on how to establish the, the next transfer window? Well, all, all I can say is there's a lot cleverer people than me at FIFA. Um, 
Emiliano and others that are doing um, a very good job in the circumstances. But I think, um, again, if I just go on the flexibility point, I, I, what, what I don't think can be discounted is if, for example, <clears throat> there may be the requirement for significant movements of capital, it might well be that, for example, there are a number of clubs in financial need to receive transfer fees. Um, and that redistribution of income becomes very important <clears throat> at certain times. So um, I just wonder whether, again, in the interests of flexibility, that although we understand that, and I know that the Premier League, for example, has gone back to the window finishing at the end of, um, with the potential window finishing at the end of August, because they didn't want um, the window to conclude by the time the season, they wanted the window to conclude previously by the time the season started. My view perhaps is that what may happen for this, if not um, um, a few windows time, is for the window to go on um, at a, to a particular point in time whilst the season is already underway. And it might be even a little bit longer into the season. Now, does that potentially cause some issues with players transferring um, whilst playing for a particular club and then playing against their club a couple of months later that they were previously at, quite possibly? But again, these are all constructs that can be changed accordingly. But again, I say again, the important element to also consider amongst this is the, the financial capital flow need, the need to ensure the integrity of the competition remains intact, and the need to ensure um, some type of regularity of approach. Now, I, I know that FIFA are looking at this in quite a lot of detail at the moment now. Ultimately, I believe the main driver for a lot of elements is to try and push back the end of the season so that the worst types of financial consequences um, of a lack of broadcasting deals and a lack, lack of financial money as a result can be mitigated. And if that can be the case, just like the question you asked, Dr. Erk, come August, and that most of the seasons, please God, might have been able to be um, concluded um, by August or September time, um, then people can look ahead to what system they can put in place for that transfer of registration. And if that flexibility allows for a longer open registration transfer period, then I think that has to be something um, to be considered. Thank you. And, and, and just another question. It's slightly off topic, but I think you, you have a lot of um, interesting insights to share on this as well. Um, it's from another FBA Canada of ours, Stefan Buskovic. He's asking whether an extension of the season due to the COVID-19 um, could impact the, the sponsors that a team plays with. For example, your Nikes and Adidas of the world, if they're due to expire on the 30th of June, what would happen if they have to play matches in, in July? Yes, and we, the, there's this exact situation with Liverpool FC at the moment. So you'd have seen the, the dispute with New Balance um, about um, their matching rights provision. And one of the elements that has come as a result of that is that because New Balance's deal is reported to expire on the 30th of June with Nike taking over as a result, there was certainly a question mark over whether if Liverpool were and any other team were to continue the season after um, July the 1st with a previously expired um, kit deal, whether um, that team would be playing in the new apparel manufacturer rather than the old apparel manufacturer. So it seems, at least from the reports, as to the Liverpool-Nike New Balance issue, is that, um, that Liverpool won't necessarily be wearing the Nike kit from the 1st um, of July onwards. But again, um, it brings into play lots of difficult issues. It might well be, for example, that um, if, for example, the season is being able to be extended, um, but the, the sponsorship deal is only until a particular period of time at the end of the season, depending on what the wording says. It might well be that a club needs to get a new sponsor in for that particular period of time. There are a number of clubs throughout Europe that don't have shirt sponsors for next season. And the likelihood of that being um, a possibility because of all of this uncertainty um, is, is pretty high, especially when sponsorship and marketing budgets are almost certainly going to be at least slashed in the short term unless um, some forward-looking brands are looking for these possibilities to help support um, uh, clubs and other types of um, you know, institutions. Thank you. Patricia, do you have any, any similar um, 
nightmares or dilemmas right now with, with your sponsors uh, in terms of the, the season ending and then having to change or? Uh, you're, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, not only with the sponsors, also with uh, broadcasting, because uh, in Spain, in Spain, in La Liga, the most important revenues uh, are coming from from TV rights, from broadcasting. So, uh, if the clubs we are not able to meet our commitments regarding TV rights and a sponsor, we will stop receiving income this season, and we will have less money available for next season for paid players transfer and for salary negotiations. So uh, I'm confident that uh, football can restart in the months to come with conditions detected by public authorities. And I believe that um, any decision of abandoning domestic competition is at this stage premature and, and uh, we will work to protect the integrity of the competition and, and follow that by given by authorities, but uh, we need to continue playing and, and, and finish the, the season. Thank you. And, and, and if I can follow up um, with a question from Jordi Mestre, who's following our, our webinar on YouTube. Um, could this situation, because you mentioned before that La Liga club seem to be very uh, cohesive right now, um, could this situation lead to an improvement of the relationships between clubs in La Liga and maybe help leaving the traditional mistrust behind? As we all know, clubs, they're very competitive on and off the pitch. Do you think that there will be a lasting positive effect in terms of the relationships between clubs? Or do you think as soon as things get back to normal, clubs will try to find their competitive advantage again uh, in different ways? I think that I think that we will um, improve our relationship because uh, we need uh, the the clubs that we have in in La Liga and we need to work together in order to to have uh, better conditions and to try to negotiate better with our players. Uh, I think that we need to to uh, learn from our players. They are always together and they are always. Uh, trying to discuss between uh, their colleagues from other teams and we need to, to do the same uh, and try to, to share our knowledge with our colleagues from other clubs um, and try to, to do our best uh, for improve the management of the clubs. Okay, thank you uh, Patricia. Um, Philip, from a, from a player's perspective, obviously um, a few interesting questions again came up. So on one side, if you're a club player, um, let's say you're at Ar Arsenal right now, you're in eight or ninth position, five uh, points behind um, a European position. What would it mean for an Arsenal player right now to not potentially not be able to finish the season and therefore not qualify for a European competition? Well, regardless of the virus or not, it's uh, it's not a good situation, of course, for Arsenal to be in, um, especially uh, uh, with the way it's gone. But um, Arsenal were on a, on a good way, and and I think uh, with the the end of the season, they could have caught uh, maybe a, a place in Europe. Um, so yeah, it, it wouldn't be a, a good situation. I agree with everyone. The, the season needs to be finished, um, but uh, you know there's a lot of conditions that need to be met uh, before uh, the game uh, starts uh, starts again. Um, uh, as a player, yeah, it will condition a lot of things. Also, the the fact that if you're in Europe, you're you're not in Europe. Um, what what is your contract situation? It, it will affect a, a lot of things for sure. Yeah, and and uh, just um, for 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 a second, going to the, the national team competition side. Obviously, you played almost uh, sixty times for the Swiss national team. Let's assume that you were due to play Euro twenty twenty, which, as you as we all know, is now uh, postponed until next year. If you are a retiring player and you had your hopes up on on, on playing in Euro twenty twenty, would you have taken the decision to extend your career one year longer just to be able to play that competition? That's personally, you mean, or uh, yeah, it probably, probably, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it depends if the body uh, allows me to, I would have continued. Um, uh, I was clear with myself before, uh, you know, the end of, um, of the first half of the season in Switzerland, I was clear with myself that um, that was enough for me. So I took the decision way early before the virus. 
Um, but yeah, it, it might if I if, if I would have said in my head I'll, I'll continue and finish the season, it would have uh, the virus probably would have told me yeah that's a good time to to finish your career right now you know. But uh, it wouldn't have been an important thing, of course. Um, the importance uh, of of health of everyone is is is, um, is the first thing. So very true. Thank you, Philip. Um, then to wrap up, I would like to ask each and every one of you um, two questions uh, with a relatively short answer from each, uh, just to just to end things. Um, so maybe Erkut, you can start, and then the question will be the same for for everyone, right? So, in your personal opinion, first of all, do you think all the leagues should be terminated, whichever the time frame? Um, and second, how do you think COVID nineteen will have an permanent impact in the football world? What do you think will never go back to the way it used to be? Um, I, I think the leagues should go on, definitely, because I think it's very important that uh, the players and everyone else, like in, in every country, football is the biggest sports in the world. And people love football. It's not just for the ones who are playing football, it's also for the ones who are watching football. It's something positive. And if the health and security is there, then they should definitely resume because it's people looking forward to it, watching again football, talking about football. Football is such a big part of their lives and not just for the football players and for the clubs, it's also for everyone else in the country. Therefore, I hope and I believe as well, the leagues will be gone, but they will play the leagues even later. One, two months, everything will be postponed for one season. It's not such a big deal. I mean, like we're making this such a, such a, such a big deal as well. I mean, we just play one month later or two months later and the transfer window might be shorter or even longer. So everything will be fine, I think, in the end. It, and people need that and the players need it as well. And uh, secondly, if COVID-19, what kind of impact on a long term? I think, as I said, for certain clubs, it will change them, right? And, um, and it will not just change club, it will change like players as well. And the families, it will change everyone because people are now going back to the normal things like washing their hands, which should be normal anyways. Right. As if it's something very new, we should wash our hands 20 seconds with hot water. This is something we should be done anyways. Like people are getting like more thinking about these things. It changes people. It changes behavior. And, uh, and I think in football, it will change certain clubs, but certain clubs, it won't change. They will just go on because they will come new owners, new investments. It will just go on. They will have new fresh money. I mean, what will happen is will be helpful. We haven't talked about it at all. I think financial fair play rules will be postponed somehow as well. I think UEFA will react or have already reacted to the financial fair play rules that clubs can actually go more in depth in the next few years, which will be also helpful on a club side. I mean, like I'm always, I can talk more on the Premier League side now because I'm here in London, I live here. And I say clubs are not in a very that bad position as if they're showing themselves right now. Most of them are profitable clubs. Lots of them have a lot of cash reserves, right? They have uh, already got the TV money. So in case they might have to pay back, but it probably they don't need to pay it back. And some clubs using a furlough, putting their employees on the government. So the taxpayer even paying their employees, which is also they're using the government. They will use the UEFA for the financial fair play. So I mean, for the players, I'm just talking on that side. They should be very careful what they do to what they commit especially here in the Premier League with certain clubs. Every contract is different. Every circumstances is different. Some contracts are more based on performances. I think for a lot of players, 30% in a different club, like let's say 30% in a club, which is based on performances, might be from some players a lot lost because if he's not playing regularly or whatever, so 30% might be a lot. But if, if someone's salary is not that much on performances, where the high base salary is high, 30% might not be that much. So as I'm saying is every case needed to be talked by the club and the players and, and the representative directly to find honest and transparent way to move forward. Thank you very much, Erkut. Daniel, same two questions for you. Yeah, I mean, I think I've talked too much already, so I'm going to say very brief. Um, I'm going to say, yeah, hopefully the season will be continued to a, a close. And I just think more philosophically, I think the world will change after this. I don't think it's necessarily just um, football. And I think one of the things to consider is maybe the um, the escalation or the increase in um, um, the way that people are consuming content. I mean, all of us didn't really know about Zoom until about three weeks ago. Never mind, use it. Now it's uh, an infinite part of our day-to-day -day world. So 
um, I would say, yeah, I think there's going to be significant changes um, to the way that uh, life is carried out post COVID. But I think this is, um, we're here for the, the long ride on here. I'm not sure there's any short term easy solutions. Thank you, Daniel. Philip, same question. Do you would you uh, like the seasons uh, finished, and uh, and what do you think will permanently change uh, in the world of football after COVID nineteen uh, is passed? Yeah, I'd like the the seasons to be finished, um, but obviously a lot of criteria need to be met uh, before uh, to 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 consider the health and safety of of everyone involved. I mean, if they talk about playing the games uh, behind closed doors, everything needs to be put in place. Uh, to make sure um, the, the players' security and, and health uh, is kept. Um, and then um, the other question about um, what, what COVID-19 will, how it will affect uh, our daily life. I think it will, it will affect uh, everyone um, in their daily life, uh, not only from washing hands, but also uh, I, I go back to the, the previous answers and how we live our life uh, in general. I think um, I'm someone who's, who's been traveling a lot in the last uh, a few months I've been going here and there all over Europe and and I'm definitely um, reducing my travels um, as much as I can uh, and, and I will in the future because uh, because we have Zoom now and we have other opportunities to, to do these things from home and I will try and keep more contact with people uh, through uh, in, into my house so that, that's what I'm going to continue doing and I'm sure a lot of people will take those measures. Okay, thank you. And Patricia, I started with you, so I'm going to finish with you. What, what okay. are your answers to these two questions? Okay. I believe that uh, leagues should be continuing until the, the end of the season, following the advices given by authorities. And um, during this, these uh, last three weeks, I've been observing emerging consumer trends and behaviors, and I think that uh, the sponsorship activation will change and it will become more digital based on social media. Uh, the second one is that the salaries of players will decrease. And the third one, uh, the way in which people consume content. E-sport is on the rise uh, with people turning into everything from Counter-Strike to League of Legends. Um, viewership on Twitch is up, I think that during the last uh, month in March is up to 30%. So uh, I think that uh, we will experience and we will note uh, after COVID-19, we will note several changes in, in the sport and in football industry. Okay, great. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you to everyone, Daniel, Erkut, Philippe and Patricia for uh, sharing some of your incredible day-to-day -day insights uh, with, with our audience. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of them um, have a lot of answers, um, ans a lot of questions answered. At the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, of course aware that a lot of uh, questions haven't been answered. For, so for those of you that want to connect directly with Patricia, Daniel, and Erkut, I know that they're on LinkedIn. So just search for their name on there. And I'm sure that they'll be happy to connect and, and follow up with them. Um, for everyone else, again, thank you so much for being with us. A little uh, reminder, everybody that joined in later or wants to share this webinar afterwards, it will be uploaded in its entirety on our YouTube channel. Uh, and also a sneak preview, because um, we know that there's a lot of people that um, like podcasts. So as of uh, today, we have the first two episodes of our webinars also transferred into audio version. Uh, and every Thursday, we will always have the latest episodes available on, on Apple Podcasts, on SoundCloud, and on Spotify. So for anyone that prefers to uh, listen to it whilst they're doing other things, that's perfectly possible from now on. Um, other than that, stay tuned on Thursday at 5 p.m. Central Eastern uh, European time for the announcement of our next webinar. Uh, it will be again a very interesting panel with very experienced uh, speakers talk, tackling a different uh, segment of the football industry and how it's affected by the COVID-19. Thank you everyone, everyone for, for spending this time with us. Um, have a good evening and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.